Welcome and thank you for joining us this evening. I'm Kathleen Rourke, Executive Director of Sales and Marketing at Candlewick Press. And I'm delighted to have the honor of introducing this first episode in the Black Creator series, Bringing Books to Your Classroom Community, a collaboration with the Teachers College Reading and Writing Project and Candlewick Press. Each month we will be featuring a Black author or illustrator in conversation with Sonia Cherry Paul, Director of Diversity and Equity at Teachers College Reading and Writing Project. Tonight, we welcome Carol Boston Weatherford, the multiple award-winning author of numerous works of children's literature. We invite you to use the comments section to ask questions. Welcome and enjoy the conversation. Thank you. So Carol, it is such an honor today to speak with you. I mean, your body of work is just such a gift to, to children and to teachers. Thank you so much for being in conversation with me today. Oh, I'm happy to be here and I'm honored to be the first. So hopefully yeah. I'll do well and the, the, the series will continue after this. <laughs> I'm sure, I'm sure there will be uh, continued conversations um, around amazing authors and illustrators and their work. So I wanna talk about your work and um, a clear theme that comes to mind as I, as I look across your work is how your writing, your books, they help children learn about Black people's lives and experiences from the names of those who are more familiar to children, such as Harriet Tubman, to, tho to those that they might be less familiar with, like Fannie Lou Hamer or Arturo Schomburg. What are you noticing about who and what children come to learn about as readers? I know that you do work in schools. What are you noticing about that? And does this influence your work? Does it help you to then decide who and what to write about? You know, children come to learn about everything that they possibly can. They don't know what they, what they should learn about and they learn about what we give them. So your, your knowledge is, is in effect limited by what you are exposed to. So I'm trying to expose them to a broader spectrum, uh, a, a truer picture of history through my books. And I'm trying to um, expose them in a way that provides intimacy and immediacy and, there, and therefore impact on, on them and, and impact on how they shape their own uh, morals, which are, you know, which are shaped, which are forming when they're young. Hmm. And I'm wondering, you know, how do you decide what's going to captivate young people? What's going to help um, them grow knowledge around people and events, particularly the ones that you're choosing to write about? What, what um, could you talk a little bit about your decision-making process about what that sure. might be? Often I try to um, show my readers that the people in my biographies or the people who are grappling with uh, the obstacles or the, the issues uh, in my books are not unlike them. And so often I try to show them uh, that person at a young age. So in uh, Schomburg, uh, we're introduced um, to Schomburg before fifth grade, but in fifth grade, kids get to see um, this incident that shaped Schomburg and set him on this quest for the rest of his life to pursue African, African and African-American history. And the incident was that his fifth grade teacher told him that African, Africa's descendants had no history worth noting, worth recording. And Schomburg, of course, proved that teacher wrong uh, during his lifelong quest to document and collect uh, Africana. Yeah. So you and know, also, so you know, so I, you know, I always try to find um, an incident that's young enough for mm. for my for my audience to connect to. So in in uh, my book, um, uh, Voice of Freedom. 
they get to see a young Fannie Lou Hamer standing on the kitchen table, uh, you know, just entertaining her family. So they get, they get to see her before she was this serious freedom fighter and right. see how, her, how that, that same spirit manifested itself in, in her personality when she was a child. And, and Carol, I think that's one of the true um, genius of your, of your writing. And, and to read any of your books is to marvel at that, that genius, your craft. You are a poet, a historian, a linguist, a story creator, and a story collector. Those little stories that you tuck in, right? Um, they have this way of, of capturing the humanity of the people that you're writing about. So um, it's so interesting to hear about your process. And I'm wondering, you know, which of these perhaps, you know, rise to the top for you as a writer, the poet, the historian, the story collector is, is one more important to you than another? How do you work to balance all of this to create these captivating stories? Well, I like to say that poetry is my first literary language. So poet, mm. the, the poetry is always gonna to rise to the top for me. And it, it's always going to be my first inclination to tell a story through verse or to examine an issue through verse. So, so the, the story, of course, is not an afterthought. The story has to, you know, the story comes first because otherwise I'm not gonna be interested enough to even write about it. But the way that I express it is always more apt to be um, in, in poetic form. That's and lovely. of course, it's, and, and I, I call my, I, I actually call my work hybrid genre because I do, as you say, uh, as you noted, um, combine poetry with uh, history, which is you know based in fact, so th there's that that poetry and nonfiction mashup. There's the poetry and historical fiction mashup. Sometimes, particularly when I manipulate voice and you know ask ask the, my subject to speak to and through me, and uh, you know in, in effect to, to let me channel their voice, so it becomes fiction at that point. Historical fiction, just the same. So, but but never, but it's always poetry. You know, poetry is always, almost always, um, going to be the genre that I choose to uh, express myself and to explore these themes. That is just so beautiful and powerful. That poetry is your first literary language, and it's the language you're using to not only tell the story but to examine an issue um, through verse and to tell a story through verse. And and you're right. Your work is this beautiful hybrid. And and one of the things to marvel at is the way that you 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 don't shy away from the hard stuff in your books. And no. you know, many teachers they wonder. And they worry, Carol, about how do I talk about topics such as, as racism with kids? And for so many educators, books are a vehicle into launching into conversations about race and racism. And your body of work demonstrates the importance of these discussions. Um, right now, we're, we're in this moment in our nation where so many teachers are, they're clamoring for books to support these kinds of discussions. They, they understand the urgency of, of them. But what advice would you give to the teachers who are still a bit reluctant? How, how can books like yours help them? Well, like you said, the books, books like mine will spark the conversation. You know, they beg, they beg to be discussed and they're tailor made for critical literacy. So, you know, we have to trust that children can handle the truth. First of all, that the children deserve the truth. They ask us for the truth. You know, when kids think something's not right, or even in the home, you know, they can tell when something's wrong. And they, even if you're trying to hide it from them, they will ask you over and over and over again, what's going on until you tell them the truth. So children need the truth. Um, you know, of course there's, you know, the matter of, you know, how much of it we can give them. And, and, and also the challenge to, uh, to give it to them in an age appropriate way, but that's where books come in, children's books come in because there are, you know, they're already age appropriate. We can't make the truth itself age appropriate. The truth is what it is, as they say, but we can make the system through which we deliver the truth, the, de the, delivery, the delivery method 
age appropriate. And that's what, that's what children's books do. That's where they come in. And then after we share the literature, we have to trust that children will ask the right questions. Mm. And here's the catch. There are no wrong questions, only wrong answers. You know, one thing I tell my, always tell my own students is that in this day and age where information is omnipresent and, and overwhelming, we have, it's more important to know the right question than it is to know the answer. So books like mine that talk about um, slavery, segregation, uh, racism, and all that, you know, all the ugliness that comes with it, beg to be discussed. And children will always ask the right question. And often I get that question at the end of presentations and at, uh, during school visits. I may share a book like Voice of Freedom or about Fannie Lou Hamer or uh, a book like Freedom on the Menu, The Greensboro Sit-Ins, which is actually one of my most popular books or, or a book like Moses uh, that's set uh, during the segregation era or, or Freedom in Congo, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, during the slavery era or, mm -hmm. or Freedom uh, in Congo Square, which is also set during slavery. And it never fails that even, it doesn't, it doesn't matter how much context I have set uh, before sharing the, the book, I always get a question afterwards. Well, two questions. One, the first one is, did that really happen? Mm -hmm. and, and it never fails, even when I show photographs uh, about the incident before sharing the book. And I often do that. They just can't fathom that adults, you know, grownups, these grownups whom they look up to, look up to allowed these things to happen. So that's the first question. Did it really happen? And the second question is, who made that stupid rule? Mm -hmm. Kids have a much more absolute sense of justice than we as adults do. That's why kids like fairy tales because fairy tales have an absolute sense of justice. The, you know, the, the villain is always vanquished in the fairy tale. You don't have to worry about whether the, the, the witch is coming back or, or Rumpelstiltskin is gonna rise again. No, he's not, he's dead you know, at the end of the fairy tale. <laughs> But, you know, adults are not that way. We dwell, we dwell in gray areas, but children know the right questions to ask because their sense of justice, you know, has not begun to, you know, negotiate those gray areas like those, like ours have as adults. Yeah, Kara, I love everything that you just said about kids. It's so true and so clear how well you know kids. Um, they do deserve the truth and they can handle the truth and they do always ask the right questions. And I feel like right now, there are many questions kids are asking. And one book in particular of yours that I keep thinking about and that I'd love educators to reach for right now is the one you've mentioned, the beautiful book behind you, Voice of Freedom, um, Fannie Lou Hamer. And um, I'm going to put this up on my screen and just talk about it with you. Um, for a little bit right now, um, because not only will kids read this book and come to know an incredible Black woman, an anti-racist who so valiantly fought for, uh, for justice, who fought against injustices, and was known as the spirit of the civil rights movement, um, but your books help kids connect the past to the present. So for example, I'm wondering if you could talk to us a little bit about uh, one of my many favorite parts. I have so many flags in here, um, but the literary te literacy test is one that I was rereading recently and thinking, oh my goodness, this is one that teachers can use right now to help kids connect the past to the present. Could you exactly. talk a little bit about this? Exactly. You know, Fannie Lou Hamer has uh, so much to teach us in, you know, in our own day and time, uh, not just about the literacy test, but about the involvement of young people in mobilizing her because she was actually, she was over 40 years old when she became an activist, when she was mobilized. And she was mobilized by, during a rally at a church to uh, register voters. 
and when when the when these young people who were from they they may not have been from the student nonviolent coordinating committee at that time, but Fannie Lou Hamer did eventually get involved with the student nonviolent coordinating committee, which was uh, helmed and organized by by uh, college students, African American college students, mainly from HBCUs, that. You know, she so so she can show us one that young people can take can and will take the lead, just as as the student nonviolent coordinating committee did then. The black the 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 young people in the Black Lives Matter movement are doing now, and they have built at in this moment the largest protest movement that this nation has ever witnessed, mm. and probably the most diverse protest movement that mm -hmm. this nation has ever witnessed. So Fannie Lou Hamer can teach us that, that, that we can trust young people to lead us and we need to listen to young people. Mm -hmm. The literacy test we can link to, to the present because the long lines that we see now uh, as we head into uh, the election, the presidential election, amount to a new type of poll tax or literacy test. And the test now is not to, uh, for you to regurgitate uh, lines of the Constitution, or for you to answer silly questions like, uh, what's the fifth word in the fourth line, and the, what's the, the, the middle letter of that word? Th these are the kinds of questions that would be on literacy test. Not to answer silly questions, but the test now is how long can you stand in line to wait to vote? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. you know, there are disparities, even now, uh, that have been reported you know, this very week as polls in state after state open, that people of color are having to stand in line so much longer than people in white precincts or, or white early voting sites. So the past does not go away. Often the same, uh, the same types of uh, oppression just take other forms. And so I, yes, and the, this page about this literacy test, everything that you're saying, so for teachers right now looking to help students understand um, voter suppression and all of its forms, um, this is going to be a launching um, place for you, a way to help kids understand that there's a legacy of our country preventing and attempting to prevent um, Black people from voting, that one voter thing, suppression like is not new. One mm -hmm. thing I like to do, Sonia, when I share this particular poem, uh, which is about when Fannie Lou Hamer tried to register to vote and couldn't because she could not um, write these passages from the Constitution, and more, more importantly, she could not explain them. And you had to explain them, and it was at the discretion of the, of the clerk whether you passed the test. And if you got one mm -hmm. thing wrong, you failed it. You know, not only is the uh, not only um, did she have to you know pass this test, but then she got in trouble with her boss when she went back to this plantation where she was a sharecropper. But teachers can pair this poem with a with primary sources like the literacy test. I know the one from Louisiana is on is uh, available online, and one from Mississippi is also available online. And I would tell teachers look at both of those and maybe give your students the, one of the tests. You know, let them challenge them with a few of those questions before they begin to read this poem. Absolutely, that is brilliant. And then also in um, Voice of Freedom. Um, and we have to just give a big shout out to Aqua Holmes. Uh, oh, yes. The illustrations are just Fabulous. remarkable. Fabulous. But the teachers are, you know, educators every day are wondering how do we talk about the Black Lives Matter movement, which you just um, gave a window into how teachers could be doing that work, and specifically police brutality. So I think about this incredible work that you've done, this book, and there is your, your work, The Beating, and then um, Injustice. And I wondered if you could just talk a little bit about the ways in which um, we could continue to be connecting the past to the present so that students understand how we got here. So many kids are asking, how in the world did we get here? Right. The book there are can help them. The, the books the books do exist now. You know, the gaps are the gaps uh in terms of the uh recording of African American history are starting to be filled in in the children's literature world. Uh there are still there are still gaps and they're 
uh, so many voices were, you know, were marginalized that we'll probably never get get all the all the gaps filled. But the, the books do exist now, and teachers can find them. There's so many anti-racist reading lists uh, online now that you know there are places where you can look and uh, figure out what some of these books are. Uh, publishers are even, you know, even have some initiatives, and many of the books have study guides online to help mm -hmm. uh, help teachers through. Uh, conversations that they might find uh, difficult. Um, mm -hmm. And the beating and, and um, injustice both have to do with an incident in uh, South Carolina when, uh, I'm sorry, in Mississippi, when Fannie Lou Hamer was beaten within an inch of her life. I mean, she wound up uh, uh, with uh, permanent, you know, lifelong, lifelong injuries from this beating. And mm -hmm. that will show, you know, will show you that not only are men were men victimized, but and this is one thing that the Breonna Taylor movement has been been trying to get across. But women, you know, women have borne the burden as well. You know, women women are have are have have been and still are brutalized. And so we don't want to forget one that women were leaders in the freedom struggle and still are, and two that women you know, take the heat, take just as much heat as men do mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and have been victimized just as much and sometimes in, in other ways. And I just, you know, I just want teachers to, to be thinking about, you know, as we try to answer these questions for kids, how did we get here? Um, how could this happen? It's essential that we are reading work like Voices, Voice of Freedom, so that students understand that the work of Fannie Lou Hamer directly connects to the Black Lives Matter movement today and the work of its co-founders, Patrice Cullors, Cullors Alicia, Gar Alicia Garza, and Opal Tometi. Um, so important that we are making those connections today. And in addition to including your books in, in classroom libraries because they, they help students learn about the lives and people and experiences um, that all kids should know about. Um, and they help to spark conversations about race and racism. Your books are essential in any biography unit in reading or writing workshop uh, where students are learning to research um, and to present about the people they are researching. And so I have to talk about another book that you've mentioned, um, another favorite for me, and that is, that is Schoenberg. So I wanna just uh, share some incredible love for this beautiful, beautiful book. Um, I wanna put it up so that everybody can see it. And um, this is illustrated by Eric Velasquez. And I mean, you've worked with some incredible illustrators to create these true works of art. Um, here's another example um, of a story of a, of a person young people should know, but may not. And, and now they have access to who he was and what he's done to spotlight black creators from the African um, and from Africa and the African diaspora. I've actually had the privilege of speaking with Eric about this book and about Arturo and his passion for this book was just really palpable. Um, where did the idea come from to write about Arturo Schoenberg? All right, a lot of times I get ideas um, from, from educators, from my travels, from museums, from family. Um, I had even been to the Schoenberg Center uh, not when it was in its current building, but I think when it was in the previous building um, in the 1980s or 1970s, uh, doing, when I was doing research. This was long before uh, picture collections uh, were digitized at all. But the idea from the book did not come about as a result of my visit to the Schomburg Center. It came about years later when Eric and I were between projects and Eric whispered, have you ever thought about doing a book on Schomburg? And I was like, mm. well, I've been to the Schomburg Center, but I'm really not familiar with the man. And so, but Eric is my friend and uh, I've worked with him more than any other illustrator. And so I said, yeah, I'll, yeah, I'll do it. So we tried, we took a stab at it. I, I uh, originally 
thought it might be a, a book length poem that would be, a, you know, a book length poem in a picture book. But it eventually became this collection of middle grade poems that became a verse, verse biography of Schomburg. Mm -hmm. So I really, um, it took a lot of research and the research was not easy because there's not a lot that's been written about Schomburg. So, you know, I had to kind of cobble together, cobble together sources to, to create this. But what I, what I give children is like a, a ringside seat, a, a front row seat to Schomburg's own quest as Schomburg collects uh, art, artifacts and uh, manuscripts and books uh, that represent the African-American diaspora, the African diaspora, not just books uh, by African descendants, but books about African descendants whether you know, good or bad, but he wanted to document that we had been written about and document our, at, at, while at the same time documenting our history. So a, a lot of artists owe Schomburg uh, a debt of gratitude, myself included, but artists dating back to the Harlem Renaissance who were his contemporaries who benefited from the collection that at that time was housed in his home. I, I, reading about Schoenberg, so incredible. I can't think of another book that exists for kids about Arturo Schoenberg. So, so incredibly uh, important for kids to get to know him and, and how he has made it possible for creators like yourself um, to do the work that you do. What's next for you, Carol? Uh, what can readers look for, forward to getting their hands on? In February, my new book uh, with Floyd Cooper will be out and it's entitled Unspeakable, the Tulsa Race Massacre. Uh, mm -hmm. Next year marks the centennial of the Tulsa Race Massacre that took place in May 1921 in Tulsa, Oklahoma. So that book will be out and it's, it's a picture book. Um, again, it's you know, a really tough topic. Uh, yes. Some people have only recently become aware of the Tulsa Race Massacre through Watchmen or Lovecraft Country. Uh, but I've known about it for, for many years. And when I uh, decided I wanted to write about uh, the race massacre, it had not occurred to me that the centennial was coming up. But one thing I did know, I wanted Floyd to work on it with me uh, because we had worked together on becoming Billie Holiday. And I just love the, the cinematic sepia toned uh, subtractive technique that he uses to create mm. such wonderful illustrations. Wow. Well, thank you, Carol, because uh, again, the Tulsa massacre is one that we know so many um, adults grew up not knowing this history. And you are just always tackling the tough topics, um, those that have been silenced. And I, I just so appreciate that because as you've said, children deserve the truth and they can handle it. Um, Carol, in Schoenberg, on the page titled Genius, you write about Arturo as a young boy drawn to books, searching for and discovering black people like Benjamin Banneker, who are also silenced in the curriculum. And you write how Arturo wondered, where were the monuments to this genius? And I just wanna say to you that your work, Carol, are the monuments to the genius of black people. Thank you for your genius for your continued dedication to addressing the gaps in children's literature, for collecting and telling stories that are seldom told. And I have one last question before we go, and that is, what does it mean to you to be a Black creator? It means that I have a responsibility, uh, not only to the children whom I write for, but to the subjects whom I write about to, I feel like, you know, I'm being entrusted with those stories and also parents by, and, and teachers by purchasing my books are entrusting me with their children. So it's a, it's a mighty responsibility. And with uh, my body of work, I, I hope to mine the past for family stories, fading traditions and forgotten struggles. And if I stay, to, stay true to that mission, I think I will have lived up to the responsibility that I have both to uh, the people of the past and to the leaders of the future. Thank you, Carol. Thank you.
Thank you so much. That was fascinating and so powerful. I hope you all enjoyed the conversation and can take this new knowledge back to your classrooms. Please join us in December for the next conversation in the series. Our guest will be Aqua Holmes, illustrator of Voice of Freedom, family, Fannie Lou Hamer, Spirit of the Civil Rights Movement by Carol Boston Weatherford, who we just heard from. For a full schedule of conversations, please visit blackcreatorsseries.candlewick.com. Thank you.